Uh, so thank you all for coming. I'm Valentin Kozen. I'm a principal technical artist at Rare, and I've been there for the past six and a half years or so. Um, most of that has been working on Sea of Thieves. Um, some of this talk uh, will be kind of a high-level overview about tech art and shader development, uh, along with uh, using Houdini. And I'll give a high-level overview, and I'll also dive down into sort of the kind of nitty-gritty details of some of the actual hip scenes uh, that we've constructed in Houdini along the way. Uh, so the pace will be quite brisk. Feel free to take pictures or videos if you need to. Um, there'll be code which I don't really have time to kind of leave up on the screen long enough for you to digest properly. Um, and obviously this is all being recorded so you can uh, go back to that for reference later. Um, so uh, normally I start with the Sea of Thieves um, release trailer but in fact it was our one year anniversary yesterday and we've uh, released the new anniversary trailer which shows off all the beautiful new things we're adding in April. That's okay, it's the, the volume is actually just set to low so it wouldn't drown people out. And in case I want to talk over it, which I didn't. <laughs> so um, we've been using Houdini in the studio for a while, but mainly on the VFX teams for rendering out explosion sprites and creating sprite sheets and doing all kind of VFX magic. Uh, for tech art, we only fairly recently adopted Houdini. It all started with a um, trip to Escape Studios in London, who put on an introductory course for us. It was a contingent of technical artists and other artists who got our hands on with Houdini and were introduced to the, the basic concepts of it. Uh, myself in particular, I took it on as a mission sort of afterwards to try and evangelize Houdini within the studio and try and take time out from my uh, normal feature work to try and uh, deliver some of the features that we're doing with Houdini and explore this cap as a new way of creating uh, tools pipelines and creating assets. Um, it was kind of a tough road sometimes because I was really, for a long while, the only sort of extensive Houdini user using it in the way that we're using it in the studio. So I uh, kind of had to figure a lot of it out as I went along. Um, nowadays, there's a, you know, every year there's more and more tutorials and this process is becoming more and more accessible, I think, to new users of Houdini, which is reflected in how many Houdini users there are out there now. Uh, so primarily I'm going to be focusing uh, specifically on how Houdini fits into shader development. So I used to work more with tools, uh, certainly on Sea of Thieves, the majority of my work has been in terms of creating graphical features and developing shaders, but when you're developing very complicated shaders, you end up having to create the pipeline for generating the data that will go into those shaders. And this is the sort of thing I'll be talking about. Uh, this talk will uh, reference uh, in part the talk that I did at SIGGRAPH last year, which is about technical art and the Sea of Thieves. That one talks more about specifically the shading techniques and all the tech we developed for that in, in Sea of Thieves. Um, that's available on the ACM Digital Library um, as a recorded video. Um, we've struggled to find a good way to share that out officially. Um, surprisingly, um, it's quite difficult to share a 1.5 gigabyte PowerPoint file. Um, but uh, very cheekily, you can get off my personal OneDrive. And um, quite cheekily as well, you can get this talk off of my 
OneDrive as well. So hopefully they'll get it out there a little bit more. Otherwise, you can just contact me and ask for the, for the links. So a little bit of background about Sea of Thieves. Uh, we're developing on Unreal Engine 4. We started on the 4.6 version. And we stopped taking our dates at 4.10 because we modified the engine itself quite a bit um, on our team. So we don't have access to some of the newer bells and whistles that uh, Unreal keeps pumping out. Uh, we use deferred rendering, and our target platform is Xbox at 900p30. Uh, in terms of lighting and shading, it's mostly stock UE4 graphics. We've done some extra implementation for cascading shadows behind the scenes and things like that. Uh, we have a fully dynamic time of day, and we don't bake out any sort of uh, static light data. Instead, we use Lionhead's LPV implementation for real-time GI. Um, we have like maybe three uh, baked out reflection maps and that's it. Um, so interestingly enough, because we're targeting the Xbox One as our target platform, um, we found our main constraint was the CPU on the Xbox One. So uh, the, the main reason for me explaining this now is that some of these techniques I'll be talking about <coughs> kind of make a lot, of, a lot more uh, sense potentially in the context of offloading work from the CPU onto the GPU. And that's, that's been a regular uh, theme of the work that we've done in TechArt. So for contents, I'm going to start out talking about vomit. Usually I do this one as the, as the last few slides to finish off a talk because it's a good comedy value, but it's actually also really useful for talking about the overall benefits of uh, using Houdini in your pipeline. Um, I'll be talking about lightning, uh, clouds, and the Kraken. And these are all kind of slightly different aspects of uh, using Houdini uh, in game development and the different ways that you can plug it into shaders. But first of all, um, there's a, just a quick high-level overview again of why would you use Houdini as a technical artist? Because presumably you're using Maya and you know, Max, and you have Python scripts and all these other tools which you're using to output data. Uh, first of all, uh, show of hands, how many of you are regular Houdini users? Just see if I'm preaching to the choir. OK, about a 50-50 split. That's good. Um, how many of you write shader code? Oh, interesting. OK. So for me, it all started with this, uh, which is how in Houdini you would go about baking your normal maps into your vertex colors, uh, rather baking your vertex normals into your vertex colors. Um, in a different package, which shall not be named, um, this might take you 10 lines, and this is also going to be extremely slow. Um, this will work for maybe 400 vertices. You've got a million vertices. This will probably take an hour or two. Um, you can do this faster, but that's going to be even more code. And for me, this was the thing, like for me as a, as a technical artist, it's like, yes. Uh, because especially if you're writing uh, shader code or you know, you're know you creating material graphs in Unreal, you're really used to being able to work with data in a very intuitive, very straightforward way. You can you know, take your vertex colors, sample a texture, multiply things, stick that into um, uh, an interpolator, access that data from the pixel shader, and everything's super quick. Everything kind of flows into every other stage of the pipeline. But the problem was that you can't do that easily in standard DCC packages. Um, here's another example. This is a quite common tech art trick um, where you might want to, for a static mesh, encode like a secondary blend shape into the vertex data. Um, there's various reasons why you might not want to use this in your sort of skeletal mesh pipeline where you can bring in blend shapes. That tends to have a lot of CPU overhead. This is virtually free. Um, there's like a little bit more memory cost on the vertices. But then in a shader, you can access uh, displacements and like a second set of normals in your vertex data and lerp from the default pose to your secondary pose which you have stored. And in Unreal, there's um, actual material functions in, in the material graph, which let you do this. But in order to bake out that data from a DCC, 
you have to use a specific script that someone has made. And there's a script for Macs that Epic have released, and there's a, a Maya script that someone's like taken that Mac script and adapted to Maya. And both of these, they're like, they are their own tools. They are 100, 200 lines of code. They have their own bespoke interface. It's a thing that someone has to assemble you know, over a course of time and then release to other people to use. And in Houdini, this is effectively a single pointer angle node with five lines of code, which just distribute this data to whatever vertex channels you want. Um, it's not even a tool. It's just something you do as part of your pipeline. You can export an FBX, plug that into your shader code, and you're good to go. So with that overview out of the way and sort of the, the basic reasons of why as a tech artist you should use Houdini, let's talk about Vomit. Uh, so it started out as a uh, NC of Thieves. You uh, can drink grog, and if you drink too much grog, you'll get drunk, and eventually you start vomiting. So um, the, as part of the feature, the tech art team got requested to create uh, technology to um, you know, render these uh, vomit decals. And this is something that we could have done quite quickly. Um, there's lots of different ways to render out a vomit decal to create these vomit decals. Could have painted in Photoshop, could have zebra sculpted a vomit puddle and baked out the normals if we wanted to be fancy. And I thought that uh, this was quite early on in the chronology of learning Houdini and implementing it in our tools pipelines. So I thought this would be a really good learning opportunity. Uh, so rather than taking a day or two days to sort of create fancy vomit decals, I thought I'd take you know, five days out, and my manager was thankfully quite obliging, and I said do this in Houdini in a slightly more elaborate way than we normally would. Uh, so the way I've done this is this is effectively, uh, I'm spawning a bunch of spheres with um, uh, noise mountain sops on the surface, and I'm assigning to those spheres uh, different density attributes. In fact, the density attribute is linked to the randomized size of the sphere. So the smaller the sphere, the higher the density to create that uh, lovely chunkiness that you would expect out of a puddle of vomit. And then just running that through a uh, fluid simulation in Houdini to generate this splatter. And what we get out of that is I'm then placing a subdivided grid of maybe 1,024 by 1,024 vertices under that splatter. And for every frame, I'm converting the polygonal mesh of the vomit splatter to a sine distance field. And for every vertex in, uh, for every vertex in the grid underneath the splatter, I'm sampling the sine distance field. And I'm effectively baking out a um, vertex color based on whether it's close enough to the uh, to the vomit splatter mesh or not. And then what I can do from there, I effectively have these uh, binary footprints for every frame of the animation. It's got sound, that's that wouldn't do. Let's get the sound. There we go. Uh, then what I can do is I can, again, in Houdini, aggregate that data over all the frames, and conveniently, there's 255 frames, I can aggregate all that data so that I bake it out to the alpha channel such that every value of my alpha channel is effectively data for one frame of this animation of vomit splattering out from its point of impact. And in fact, what this uh, original animation that I was showing just now is, this one, is I am thresholding through that um, grayscale alpha value so you have the animation of its splattering baked into just that single uh, scalar texture. And what that has allowed to do was, after we did the initial um, prototype of this and we showed it to the art director, the art director was like, guys, we don't want people to actually feel sick when they're sick in the game. This is, first of all, it looks too disgusting. We don't want the chunkiness in there. And secondly, he was like, well, we have um, one of the core pillars of, uh, one of the core art pillars uh, of our game is this kind of painterly style where we don't have a lot of high frequency detail. And he was like, you know, the, the image on the left you see here, that's a lot of high frequency detail. It doesn't really fit in with our art style. 
So I was like, OK. And so I went back to the Houdini simulation. I started tweaking the simulation parameters, changing the density, changing how I was creating these um, uh, balls of vomit, which I was spattering onto the ground. And I ended up tweaking them to make them less chunky and more viscous. So the bits that you are seeing here, uh, we st this is actually a chronological um, concatenation of all the different uh, simulations I've run. And as we go along, they start becoming more sludgy, gungy, kind of viscous um, shapes, which our, our director was happier with. And he wanted kind of these more simplified shapes. And so we were very easy, easily able to go back, tweak the simulation, tweak those values, get a set of values we were happy with, and then you know, just alter the seed and bake out a bunch of different variations for our actual final decals. And then as a little extra step, uh, I was able to just tilt the gravity value slightly and get the vomit running down a particular direction. So now we have a version of decals <coughs> for vomit running down the wall in case you vomit on the wall. And uh, in the actual game, this is actually, most of this is quite difficult to notice because the vomit decals are actually quite small at the end of the day. But um, if you exaggerated the mechanic a little bit, it might look something like this. So there's a few other shader effects going on top of this. Um, we're also baking out a thickness map from, uh, from that simulation, which we're using as the actual translucency. And we're adding some extra normal animations on top to make it look like it's splattering. Uh, but that's the basic approach. Lightning. Um, with lightning, we had this uh, interesting uh, problem that we want to have lightning, which you can see in the distance underneath a storm, you have these arcing lightning bolts. But you can also be inside a storm, and you can be struck by lightning. It will hit you in the face. So we wanted to have a solution for lightning, which will work at very different distances. And normally, I think lightning will be done as uh, as effectively billboard planes with uh, some kind of lightning texture applied to it. And that can be good for certain effects, especially if they're always far away, but it doesn't really scale that well with distance. And especially if the lightning is coming directly towards you, you kind of want to see the three dimensionality of it. So I decided to try and implement it as a 3D mesh. Uh, this is the final result. Uh, this was inspired by looking at a lot of um, high-speed camera footage of actual lightning strikes and looking at the behavior of lightning where you start out with this kind of searching phase where you have multiple tendrils all coming out at about the same rate trying to find a point where they can make ground contact. And then finally, one of these tendrils will find uh, contact with the ground and then all the other ones fade off, whereas that main branch thickens and becomes brighter, and that becomes your primary lightning bolt. And then everything fades out. Um, by doing it with the mesh, we were able to have a lot less overdraw than we would um, if we bake this out to a texture. And like I said, it allows it to scale a lot easier with distance. Uh, once you get further away, for example, you can artificially push out the vertices out along their normals and give you a thicker light lightning bolt when you look at it from two kilometers away as opposed to directly in front of you. Uh, so the way we did this is um, effectively using L systems in Houdini. Uh, they helpfully already have a lightning preset. Um, I had to modify that a little bit because there was an issue with the lightning preset. Um, and we've uh, hooked up the seed to the frame so you can create as many variations of this lightning as you want. Uh, the, the main modification we had to do was uh, add more rotation to the L system because the default preset kind of looks very good from a certain axis, but if you rotate to a different axis, um, all the kind of random squiggliness actually happens kind of only in one direction. In the other direction, the lightning is actually perfectly straight, which didn't really work for us because we wanted these things to uh, work from all directions. Uh, so what I'm doing here is, again, this was early on in my usage of Houdini. There's likely more elegant ways of doing this, but the brute force approach is I've just duplicated the L system three times. And I'm getting slightly different data out of each one. In this one, I've set the angle variation to zero so that here I can take the Y position of every point and I can bake that down to the vertex 
And that effectively gives me the distance traversed from the origin of the lightning um, along each of its branches and tendrils. I've also got one version of the lightning which is, um, has a very thick main branch where effectively, again, I am comparing the distance of the vertex from the center of the L system to its current position. And therefore, I can bake out a binary value for every vertex to see whether that vertex is on the main branch or not. And finally, the middle uh, version is just has very thin thickness, which is the final, I think, um, uh, actual mesh that I'm going to use. The vertices are pushed to the center of the L system uh, of each branch, not entirely together, because otherwise, if you export that, that creates degenerate geometry. Um, but you know, close enough together that it's very thin, but you still have the vertex normals, which you can then use to push the vertices in and out to give the lightning thickness when you want it. So then there's a point wrangle node here, and there's some code there which effectively takes all of these three meshes. They all have the same topology. So I can very easily grab vertex data from one mesh, grab vertex data from another mesh, bring them in, and then figure out where I want to put them in. I think in this case, you can see I'm creating a single UV set, and UV.x is that value which tells you whether this vertex is on the main branch or not. And UV.y is lightning progress, which is just the distance along that branch that uh, this vertex has traveled. And this is all the data that I'm exporting along with the normals. Oh, no. Uh, keep forgetting that space does not continue playing a video. Uh, so I'm going to have to use this screen to kind of skip ahead. So uh, the, what I'm doing from that afterwards is I'm picking out the point which is at the very top of the lightning stem. And I'm kind of saying that that's the target point. And then there's a little bit of transform maths uh, at the end to basically align the start point and the end point of the lightning bolt so that the start point will always be at 0, 0, 0, and that the end point is always at 0, 1, 0, or once it's um, imported into Unreal 0, 0, 100, because we want this to be a standardized one meter long uh, lightning strike. And so you can see there's uh, some transformation code in there for getting it aligned. And then it's also flipped, so the origin point is at the top. What this means is that we can literally place the lightning mesh at the position of the impact that we want, and you immediately have that lightning mesh kind of coming out at a set distance. So here you can see all of the values we've written out. And if I skip forward a tiny bit, or in fact, it's getting to that now, uh, this is effectively what we'll export because we have all of the data now. The mesh is normalized. It's you know, set up into the scale and parameters that we want. But then what we can also do is we can actually preview the shader inside Houdini. So this is how I'd go about uh, templating the shader to begin with. I can actually do run the code that I want to be running inside the VEX node. Uh, so what this is doing is there's a time variable, which is just a slider that I'm running back and forth. And as time goes up towards one, all of the vertices get pushed out from the center of the lightning branch, and you get this sort of thickening effect, especially in combination with the value I've written out about progress through the lightning branch. Uh, you get a progressive effect as they start thickening at the core, but they're still thin at the tips. Uh, if I continue playing this, you can see that happening there now. So you get this growing tree effect. But then what happens is I'm setting a threshold value, which is at 0 0.7. 0.7 0.7 is the point at which this will all run to the maximum um, value for uh, progress through the, through the lightning branch, which means that we know that our main branch will have hit its final contact point. At that point, we have an if statement in here which will switch out the logic a little bit and have the secondary branches start to fade out. 
and instead on the main branch we start thickening it even further and making it brighter and that gives us like that main thunderbolt uh, source towards the end and then as time value goes to one everything fades out and so this is slow motion of these meshes being imported into Unreal. Um, the final code that we're using, we've modified slightly because you'll notice the tips aren't thin when they're searching out. Instead, we've inverted that function a little bit so that the tips taper towards the top, but they're always a little bit thicker when they're searching outwards. That just improves the visibility and makes the effect look better. And we're not doing all of the fading just with pushing the vertices in and out. We're also using uh, an alpha mask on this mesh. But effectively, it's mostly the same logic that's running in the shader here. Uh, each bolt at the end of the day is about a thousand vertices, and we've got four loaded in at all times, firing at random from the storm. And yeah, it worked out quite well. It's extremely cheap to render. Uh, so next up, uh, clouds. So again, this is uh, going to cover a little bit um, of what I talked about at my SIGGRAPH talk. I'm just going to very quickly run over how we render them and why we're rendering them the way that we're rendering them. Um, effectively, this was our um, art direction that came through from the concept artists. We wanted to have very strong geometrical shapes for clouds. We wanted to have storms, which are volumetric, three-dimensional objects that actually sit in the world rather than being you know, detached um, images that are hovering somewhere infinitely far away in the sky. And as you can see in the image on the bottom left, they wanted to have skull clouds, which would actually hover above an actual island which you could travel to. So we knew we had to do something very special in terms of the tech to render these clouds. Uh, we did some early um, iteration with um, using billboards and you know, normal maps to light them, combination of alpha and various other data baked out into them. Uh, we experimented with having storms that are you know, uh, ray marching through various 3D textures and getting lighting effects out of that. Uh, ultimately, what we've settled on, which gives us images such so as this beautiful sunset from a subreddit called Sea of Photography, um, is we're effectively rendering polygonal geometry, solids, you know, 3D model, polygonal geometry, and we're running filters over that to soften it out and make it look like they're clouds. Um, that has allowed us to add ship-shaped clouds uh, in a later update, which is even more difficult to do than a skull-shaped cloud. Uh, so our main challenge was how do we make solid geometry look fluffy and how do we do that in an extremely cheap fashion. And in brief, the way we do this is that we render out the cloud meshes to an off-screen buffer. And these are rendered really quickly with um, forward rendering and a vertex shader, in fact, for the lighting. It's not even doing any pixel shading. Um, we scale that off-screen buffer down to a quarter size, and then we do a very quick single-tap blur. Uh, we offset the standard deviation of the blur by the depth so that clouds that are farther away look sharper. Um, we had an interesting um, problem that we wanted to save out both the depth so that we can do depth-based effects with the clouds once we're compositing them, and the alpha. Um, but to keep things really fast and cheap, we only have a single RGBA buffer. So we've actually only left with two channels for color. So we're encoding sunlight into a single channel and skylight into a second channel, which later down the line proved to be extremely difficult when they said they wanted the skull cloud's eyes to glow green. Um, <laughs> uh, but what we're doing is we're doing a box blur on the depth and this allows us, uh, this box blur is slightly wider than the Gaussian blur we, that we run on the um, two color channels on the alpha channel. And this means that for every pixel we then sample on the clouds, we have a blurred depth and therefore kind of a blurred world position. Uh, and then there's a alpha blended quad which is being rendered in front of the camera which uh, samples this off-screen target and composites it with um, all the main stuff that's going on in the scene. So we, from that blurred depth, we reconstruct this uh, blurred 
world space position. Uh, based on the world space position, we sample a cube map, which has a hand-drawn noise map, uh, which uh, is available in both large scale and uh, fine detail flavors. And then based on the depth, we toggle between these two noise maps so that clouds in the distance have smaller noise features than clouds up front. And that prevents it looking like a frosted glass effect. Uh, and again, for the alpha, we use that blurred depth map to make sure that clouds in the distance have sharper edges, whereas clouds up front are using the full uh, extent of that uh, blurred alpha pass. And now we're using the uh, noise maps to add little swirls and distortions to the contours of the clouds. And we do the same with the colors. Here we start sampling the actual sky color, the actual sun color, and we get the full RGBA output. Then the only thing that's missing here is again, because we have that blurred depth pass, we do another pass of exponential height fog, and that allows the clouds to blend in with the sky box. So that's just a little bit of background. No Houdini there, unfortunately. Uh, so what I'm, oh, sorry, if you want to take a picture, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to talk about is um, this base pass, about how do we actually render out this geometry in such a way that you know, they are appropriately translucent and extremely cheap to render. Like I said, this, all the lighting is done in a forward vertex pass, but we kind of want them to look subsurfacey and cloud-like. Uh, so this is a test um, a hip file scene that I created just for this presentation. It's doing mostly the same things as the, what we actually did for the game, but that was a long while ago. So like, rather than going through some of the messy code of me figuring out how to do this the first time around, this is a little bit cleaned up and a little bit more correct. So I'd rather give you guys the correct way of doing things rather than the actual way we did things. Uh, so I'm hoping this will be a little bit more useful. So we start in by bringing in our cloud geometry, which in this case, I decided to go for the most difficult case for the demonstration, which is an actual fully detailed ship, which has been generated from our galleon. Um, we're doing vertex uh, rendering, and we're saving our vertex data. Uh, to verify our techniques, it's better to bring this a little bit closer to uh, per pixel rendering. So we stick a remesh node on that, and that gives us a higher density mesh. And then effectively, we just uh, convert that to an SDF, and we ray march through it in a sort of standard Beer's Law kind of ray march thing, similar to how like Horizon Zero Dawn, if you've seen their talk, how a lot of these ray march cloud systems do it. Uh, it's effectively, for every pixel, the amount of light is equal to the exponent of minus attenuation times the overall density that the cloud, that the the ray of light has had to travel through to get to, um, well, to, to the eye. Um, this isn't modeling some of the kind of more complicated in scattering that you get in the cloud. It's just kind of going out through, out through the sign distance field, and it's just for every point that's inside the sign distance field, it's then ray marching some ways towards the direction of the light, and it's adding up all that density. Uh, so in this case, what you're seeing is um, I've actually created a point wrangle SOP, which is doing that rendering and outputting the, uh, the result as a vertex color. And because I've plugged in the camera position into the vertex SOP, I've, I have these, this uh, vertex color renderer update every time I move the camera in the viewport. As you can see, it's actually really fast to do ray marching in a point SOP in, in Houdini. <laughs> Like, it, it updates really quickly. This, this isn't sped up or anything. Uh, a little advantage of doing, uh, of prototyping your ray marching algorithm in a point wrangle is that you can actually really easily visualize what all of your ray march samples are doing. Because uh, if you think about it, you have a for loop, which is you know, creating a new world space position where you want to sample, in this case, your sign distance field, or it could be a fog volume. Um, what you can do is, for debugging purposes, you can add in a function which says, hey, for every sample, also create me a point. And then at the end, you can say, hey, you've got this array of all the point samples you've created. Uh, create me a curve out of them. And this is what you're seeing. So you can see the camera up there in the top left. 
and I'm starting the sampling at the first vertex that I'm hitting. Well, rather, that's, that's the vertex that's currently being rendered. And then from that vertex, whenever it's inside the sign distance field, it shoots out an array of samples towards the direction of the light. And you can see where you're taking those samples, which makes it really easy to then look at this and be like, oh, god, I'm doing too many samples. I don't need that many. Or you can add in an exponential function, for example, to bias the samples uh, towards the point of impact. But then you're saying, I don't need more samples further out. Uh, this is actually what the code for this looks like. It's pretty compact. And you can see, uh, you can see all the, the two for loops that are running through this and the, uh, the density function. Uh, so you'll notice at the start, I've pulled out the bit where it's sampling the sign distance field into a separate function. Uh, the reason for that is that we're going to replace that later with a different kind of sampling. Uh, as a side note, you can very easily jitter your, the direction of your vectors that are for directional lighting going out towards the directional light. You can instead sample them randomly on the hemisphere. That's also just a function that exists in VEX. And then you can also have a skylighting pass. Again, it all runs quite nicely and looks actually pretty good in the viewport. So in our case, we don't actually want to save out sign distance fields for clouds. Um, that said, that might be something that you would actually want to do in, in your projects, especially with uh, newer versions of Unreal. Obviously, you have sign distance field representations of all the meshes available to you if you're, if you're using that. So you could absolutely just literally do it this way, take a polygonal mesh, and then raymarch through its sign distance field and calculate this kind of um, subsurface scattering through you know, participating media in this way. Um, but we're not doing that, and we want this system to be really lightweight. So my approach was instead to bake out data for every vertex, which represents something of the entire mesh that that vertex belongs to. And a good point to start there is to just shoot out a whole bunch of arrays and see where they hit. Uh, you might notice that I don't actually have any ray intersect functions in here, and that it's still four loops ray marching through a sign distance field. This is kind of like a neat little trick. Um, the ray intersect can be incredibly slow when you're um, trying to intersect with a very dense geometry, which in this case, the ship is pretty dense. Um, I've actually found that ray marching through a sign distance field can give you pretty accurate results. And when you don't need that pixel perfect accuracy of I'm hitting this triangle and this spot, actually ray marching through a sign distance field gives you much, much faster results if you just want to get rough line intersects. It's really good if you're doing occlusion baking and things like that. Uh, so in this case, I am casting out about 2,000 rays. And then I am averaging all of these rays that I've uh, cast out to get and averaging them biased, I think, by their, uh, by their length to get a kind of array of most occlusion. It's kind of an, almost like an inverse bend normal sort of baking process. Uh, and then along that ray of most occlusion, I am doing another ray march just to see how far that goes. So again, we can visualize this in Houdini because we still have access to all of these attributes. We can promote any local attributes that we're using inside VEX to be accessible by other nodes further down the line. So we can see from this point all the rays that we're casting out. And what we're going to do with all this data is we're effectively going to create this kind of lobe out of it, which is going to be our internal representation per vertex of where most of the mass and occlusion on the ship is. Um, at this point, I should point out that you know, this was sufficient for us. This is really low tech. Um, you guys can probably quite easily replace this with um, you know, a fitting function for a group of Gaussian lobes, or you can you know, calculate a spherical harmonic per vertex out of this. And you're going to get a much more accurate representation of the mass of the ship, and then you can sample that. Uh, in this case, this is kind of enough for our purposes. Um, this isn't even quite a Gaussian lobe. Um, it doesn't have the EXP. Uh, it, it does have a POW in there, but the power is actually 4. So it's just all multiplication and addition. And you can see kind of um, what this looks like across different vertices. Let's see how I'm going to do for time. Uh, 
cool. And then all we have to do is um, earlier when you saw we had our function for ray marching through the sine distance field, uh, we split out the sine distance field uh, sampling into its own function. Now we can just replace that function with checking is that position inside this vertex's um, occlusion lobe. And we end up with uh, ray marching through these occlusion lobes. And this is the result you get out of that. So we've clearly lost a lot of detail. But a lot of the um, actual subsurface scattering behavior is still there. And actually, the, the qualitative look is, is pretty good. Um, we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, by, this is with all of the exact same ray marching and density and attenuation attributes. This is with the lobe data, and this is uh, ray marching through the sine distance field. So we're definitely losing a lot of detail. Certainly on thin um, geometry, we're losing some of that lighting up that it should be doing. Uh, but the overall brightness values are quite similar. Uh, the main artifact you can see is towards the back of the ship, it gets darker and should still be quite bright. This is because of the way that the lobes are orientated, because you're only really getting inclusion in a single direction rather than two directions. Again, you can expand on this um, if you want, and you can bake out more data and approximate this volume better. But this worked well for us. Oh, and there's, a, there's an attribute blur pass after we calculate this, uh, the direction of mean occlusion and the length of that uh, ray of mean occlusion, which just smooths everything out. Uh, as you remembered, we were using a high-density remesh. So if we now turn that off, we can see how it looks on the original mesh. And if anything, that actually helps a little bit in uh, bringing some of that detail back because of the way that these vertices are being distributed. And then the difference here is that I've copy-pasted all of that VEX code, uh, replaced some of the properties, and it has now magically become HLSL code. And this is running in Unreal. Um, the main difference you'll see here is there's a little bit of shimmering because we're now running this properly on the vertex shed and we're interpolating it per pixel via natural HLSL processes. Um, if this is a problem for you, you can then go back to Houdini and tweak uh, your ray marching uh, to make sure that the output is less banded. Because effectively, if I move this code into pixel shader code, you can see there is banding because of the ray marching steps that were taken. This can be optimized. Um, but then, obviously, at the end of our pipeline, we are just blurring and distorting everything at the end. So that shimmering isn't really noticeable for us once you've actually got the full uh, composited output. And you don't have to ray march towards a one single directional light. You can ray march towards a point light. And so you'll get really nice scattering through a whole bunch of different objects. Uh, it's worth noting that the main uh, thing that you're losing with this, unlike with um, ray marching through, you know, 3D textures like Horizon does is obviously none of these objects have any awareness of other objects around them. Um, so, you know, that's something that you could potentially add to the shaders of extra data about, you know, what is the spherical harmonic of occlusion around your object or whatnot. But in our case, all our clouds tend to be separate objects, so it's not been an issue. And in fact, we use this not only for the directional lighting, but on the storms, uh, the lightning that you see inside of the storm cloud is a point light that's spinning around. And whenever it gets close to the surface, its light bleeds out, and you can see it as flashes of lightning. So that's it for clouds. And the final topic is the Kraken. So the Kraken uh, started coming together quite late in production. Um, I think in, you know, we released uh, end of March last year, around January, we still didn't really have much for Kraken. Um, so we wanted to pull together quite a lot of assets um, at the same time. And one of the issues we had was design wanted the Kraken to wrap around ships. That's kind of mandatory for a Kraken in a sailing game. Um, we also had an issue that the animation graph for the Kraken was quite slow to evaluate. It's a massive tentacle. It needs a lot of joints to wrap around things and wiggle smoothly. 
Uh, we were doing, we are doing this for freestanding tentacles when they're not attacking the ship directly, but for wraps, we kind of wanted to save CPU perf. Uh, we had the issue that it's a lot of wraps. Um, design want the, crack, the, the Kraken to be able to wrap around the front of the ship, around the back of the ship. There's variations based on which bits of the ship it's blocking you off from interacting with. Uh, and we obviously need to make the, all these wraps look good and prevent the tentacles from clipping through geometry. Uh, in all, this means that this would be a mammoth amount of work for animators because they would have to go through every position, you know, frame by frame, move all these joints out of the way, get it all um, lining up with the hull as best as they could. And again, these are quite large chunks of geometry. They're not that high detail. They don't have that much control over what the surface is doing. So. We were inspired by a talk at SIGGRAPH um, by the guys uh, who did uh, Finding Dory 2. Uh, it was called uh, Finding Hank. And they talked about their simulation pipeline for animating Hank the octopus, who has lots of flubbery tentacles, which is exactly what we're doing. Uh, so we decided, let's try and do this as well. We, we create the animation, but then we use Houdini to drive an FEM sim to get that animation to actually physically interact with the body of the ship. And then we can do, use the now extremely popular technique of uh, saving out that animation per vertex to a texture and read that in a shader with the uh, normals and positions. Uh, so this is an early pre-visualization of uh, combining uh, FEM simulation and animation. It's a sea cucumber, obviously. Um, but putting that into production, uh, that was actually quite challenging. Uh, this is our hardest wrap position where the tentacle actually has to penetrate through the back of the sloop. And we kind of got this result a lot. And I think the main issue is that if you're using pin constraints on some of the points in your um, FEM sim to drive the underlying geometry, if any of those pin constraints get trapped against collision, it we really struggle to get that to resolve properly. It would just get stuck because the pin constraint is always pushing it in into, into the collision, and the other forces don't seem to be enough to move it out of the way. Um, our original solution was actually to reduce the fidelity of the collision simulation, which allowed this stuff to work better. It would still clip. Uh, it, it, well, instead, it would clip through some of the thinner geometry, but you actually still get very good wrapping behavior around the bulk of the ship. And then we did some additional um, SOP work to basically sample the sign distance field of the ship and push out vertices to resolve kind of those smaller intersections. So this sped up the animation workflow massively. Um, this meant that animators could effectively reuse pretty much the same animation and just roughly line up uh, where the designers wanted that pose to be. Uh, at the time of speaking, there's 19 wrap animations across three different ship types. And then the FEM simulation could just push out all of the um, animation vertices and get that tentacle to conform to the shape of the ship properly. Um, we also have a state machine for the tentacles. So there are frames at different parts of the linear animation, which are actually identical, which allow for uh, the animation to skip between different states, states where it knows there's the same frame from which it can resume playing. Uh, so this is uh, going to be fairly quick run through the animation graph of how this stuff is actually being generated. Uh, we import uh, the alembic animation from Maya, or rather we import the animation as an alembic from Maya, and we have a simplified representation of the ship collision. As you can see, there's, in the original animation, there is a lot of clipping going on. And the first frame in this animation is the bind pose, which helps us uh, with some of the setup. Uh, so this is the graph for actually doing all of the simulation. Um, we begin with tweaking the mesh collision a little bit. We we'll basically thicken out some of the areas which are really thin and where we can get into section otherwise. And we add a little bit of uh, cheeky guide geometry just to funnel the tentacle on its way so it goes where we want it to go in, mainly in this specific animation. Honestly, none of the other animations were anywhere near this problematic. It, it just, it all works, but this one is a special case. 
<laughs> so now we uh, want to create a tetrahedral simulation mesh. Uh, so we take the original mesh and we basically put down some polyfill and Boolean nodes to turn it into a single unified watertight mesh uh, from which we can then create a tetrahedral kind of slightly lower poly representation, uh, which we can then use with FEM. Or as in this case, we've um, once Houdini 17 came out, I went back and rewrote this to use Vellum, and it's now both a lot more stable and a lot faster. Um, what you see here is uh, once we have the tetrahedral representation, we use a bounding box um, to pick out a whole bunch of points down the center of the tentacle and a little bit in uh, its mouth flaps. And this is the, uh, the backbone of it. Um, these points will have pin constraints applied to them, which actually drive the animation, whereas the points which are more on the outside are all simulated. We use a point deform node to then animate this um, tetrahedral mesh uh, based on the original animation. And now we start bringing it into the Vellum simulation. Lots of file cache nodes so that to prevent duplicating work. Um, yeah, so now we're ready to simulate. Uh, here you can see we're applying a bunch of different constraints. We ended up going with pin constraints, distance constraints, uh, tetrahedral volume constraints, and um, kind of quite late in the game, I realized that it really helps to have some struts in there to help preserve some of that actual shape. Uh, the tetrahedral constraints weren't doing that by themselves. Uh, so now we've got the vellum solver itself. Um, it really helps with the whole workflow of this to have the vellum solver inside SOPs. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of setup. In our case, we did end up having to rely on an extra little trick just to um, resolve those um, problems where the pin constraints conflict with the collisions. So we added some geometry wrangles into the solver, uh, which effectively looks up into a volume we've predefined and turns down the strength of the pin constraints or turns them off entirely based on a sign distance field. So as the tentacle gets closer to the ship, uh, that backbone stops animating and it relies on the rest of the animation to push the tentacle through. And that helps resolve those collision issues because uh, those pin constraints are basically inactive when they're too close to geometry. And so this is the result of the final bake. And as you can see, it's getting really nice squishy de deformation as it kind of lunges and uh, wrangles its way through the back of the ship. And then at the end of the day, we do a point deform to um, get our original mesh back. And this makes sure that we still have all the UVs and all the other parameters. Uh, how am I doing for time? Uh, cool. So uh, there's a little bit more to, sort of, to this. Um, we do some blending of frames to preserve the identity of those keyframes that I talked about earlier and to allow the um, the animation to start and resume at these various points because they're identical in the animation, but obviously not identical after simulation. And the other main thing is that this is a very large mesh which doesn't have that many vertices. So it's crucially important that we preserve normal uh, detail on the mesh, which means we actually can't get away with just exporting out uh, normals and uh, point positions. We also have to export out the tangent data so that we can actually have the full animated um, tangent frame for every vertex once we're uh, rendering it. So we do that with a polyframe, which gives us tangents. And we use a vertex split uh, along UVs so that we double up those points and we have uh, separate tangents for the two points on either side of a UV split. And uh, later, so we have an additional step, which I'm going to skip through in the interest of time, where we effectively take that baked out animation and we do a poly reduce and then we bake out another even simpler representation of this tentacle, which we use for the distant LOD. Uh, that has its own set of animation textures, which are much smaller and use a lot less memory. And then finally, we use a modified version of the game dev tools um, vertex animation uh, node, which was really good jumping off point. 
Uh, effectively, we've added uh, an additional few parameters in there for baking out the tangent animation data. In our case, we're actually putting that into the alpha channel of the position texture, which is an EXR. So we have 16 bits of data into which we encode that, uh, that vector. It really does not need to be particularly precise, and it all works quite well. And the other bit, which I believe this video might have already skipped through. Oh, no, I don't think it has yet. Uh, the other thing that we do is we, in the same pass, we create collision data. And the way we do this is we specify a range of frames during which we expect the animation to be collidable. And we add up all of those frames. We uh, just create a single big sign distance field, which uh, accumulates all of these frames as you can see here. And we basically create one large collision mesh out of all those frames, which ensures that wherever the tentacle is in its animation during those frames, the player can't intersect with it. And that's kind of the, the resulting collision mesh that you get out of that. Uh, and the really horrible looking mass of all the tentacle <laughs> positions is quite ghastly. So yeah, and there's a little bit here where you uh, create the actual um, tangent vertex data. It's basically done the same way as you do normal. So you just uh, pump out a different uh, channel from your vertices. So that's the recap for everything I just said. Um, one thing I failed to mention is that we actually decimate uh, the number of frames by eight. So we only export 117 frames out of uh, animation, which is originally 937 frames. And we do interpolation in the shader, which gets everything looking very nice and smooth, kind of like this. Uh, this is all the wraps that we shipped with, all the working in unison and uh, doing all their squidgy deformation. So one less, last little note, just to bring this talk full circle, uh, one final tip that we found uh, when doing the tentacles is I talked at the start about how useful it is to bake out, be able to bake out a second uh, sort of blend pose into a static mesh and bake that into the UVs. But obviously, you can't do that if an object is skinned. Or rather, you can, but you have to go through the whole proper blend shape slash morph target pipeline in your skeletal animation um, system. So if we don't want to pay that cost, well, your tangent coordinate frame is updated for free by the skeletal animation. So what you can actually do is you can bake your blend shape data, those uh, vertex displacement, into tangent space instead. And that's, for example, how we do the suckers on the tentacle. The displacement vectors are baked into tangent space and then converted out of tangent space during the vertex shader step and added to their current positions. And in this case, we have uh, several dozen suckers. If you were doing this with a skeletal mesh, you would probably have to have multiple blend shape for all these guys. But in this case, we have a single blend shape, and we offset that animation in the vertex shader using vertex colors. Uh, this is tech that we also reuse for the gills on Megan. And again, this is extremely simple code in VEX. You, you do your polyframe node, and you create a matrix which transforms from tangent to world. You invert that matrix, and then you just multiply your displacements by your world to tangent matrix, and now you have tangent space displacements. So to wrap things up, um, I'm hoping you've learned some useful tips and uh, tips, tricks, and techniques, and ways in which you can combine your Houdini and shader work. Um, if you write HLSL, I think you can see that you'll find a lot that's familiar in the way that you write code, but also just in the way you think about your data um, once you're working in Houdini. And similarly, if you're a Houdini user and you write VEX, uh, maybe you'll see that uh, if you haven't done any shader work, this is also something you'll find quite similar. That sort of flow of data from Houdini into HLSL, you can then start choosing what do you want to do where. If you're writing a shader, you can choose to offload some code into the pixel shader or some code into the vertex shader or into the compute shader. Uh, but you can also do this in terms of just taking that code and moving it into your tools or vice versa. So uh, mandatory we're hiring slide. Um, this is our beautiful campus. Uh, it's not actually drone footage, it's photogrammetry. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, contact uh, me or Nigel Ang, who's our technical art director, if uh, 
you're interested in sort of asking any more questions. I don't know if we've got time for questions. I suspect not. Yeah, I thought as much, but I'll be outside so you can grab me if you want. So thank you very much for coming, guys.